Thursday, June 7, 18, 2020, and at this time I will call the meeting of the uh, Apache Junction Library Board to order. Uh, before we go any further, it is my unfortunate duty to call this meeting to order because our president, Willie, has passed away. And in that uh, regard, I'd like us to take a moment in regard to him and just have a moment of silence. Thank you. Nancy, could you take roll, please? Uh, actually, James will take the roll. Oh, James, all right, that's right. <laughs> oh, got it. All right, Braden B Biggs. Here. Judy Borey. Here. Samuel Gray. Here. James Jackson, present. Frank Schoenbeck. Here. Vera Walters. Here. Pam Harrison. Here. And Sancy Brown. Here. All right. <laughs> Thank you, James. Mm -hmm. This time I will uh, entertain a motion to accept the agenda as written. Are you the chair now, or are you the vice chair? The vice president. The president <laughs> is gone. He died. Mr. Vice President? I don't... Oh, I don't know. What, what, what do we call you at this point? Uh... Mr. Vice President, I guess. Uh, yeah. He hasn't been appointed president. Okay, Mr. Frank. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I move okay. to accept the agenda. Do I have a second? I second that motion. Motion is made and seconded. Any discussion? If not, please take a roll on the vote, please, James. Take a roll on the vote, please. Yep. Okay. All right, Braden Biggs. Yes. There we go. Judy Borey. Samuel Gray. Yes. Willie Howard. No. Oh, Willie Howard. Wrong name. Is there anything you want to talk to her about? Uh, all right. James Jackson. Yes. Frank Schoenbeck. Here. Yes. Vera yes. Walters. Here. Yes. Okay, first on the agenda is discussion and possible vote for approval of the Apache Junction Public Library Board of Trustees 2019-2020 annual report. Sansi, is this yours? Okay. So in front of you on the screen is the um, Apache Junction Public Library Board of Trustees annual report for 2019. 2020. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to get the margin off here, but I don't know how. That little, uh, the little arrow on the, in the middle. <laughs> yep. Oh, you're so smart. Thank you. <laughs> um, I sent this out to you uh, via email on Tuesday to take a look at it. Um, the main points in our annual report this year would be that we are adapting to the changes that have um, come this past year. Um, the new services page would be the page that I would feel is the most um, important because of the different things we have done in the library to um, engage our community to get more people into the library and to accommodate them during um, this crisis time. Um, we've also had some new programs that we've um, done this year that included our writer in residence, who is our first writer in residence. Um, which was very successful. Um, unfortunately, I had to be um, turned into podcast, audio podcast, once um, the library closed in mid-March. We had a Christmas program, uh, Child's Christmas in Wales, which was an adult program that was well-received, and then also um, a health program called A Matter of Balance for adults that would help them um, manage concerns about falls. Um, sensory Storytime was one of our new children's programs, um, and that is a program that um, helps those that have autism around the, the spectrum or have some sort of sensory um, limitations. They don't you know, normally do well in large crowds like would happen at a normal story time, so these are tailored to fit their needs. 
Um, we did registration for that one to keep the numbers down, and every time we did it, we did have um, a full house of kids um, up to the, the maximum number that we would take, and they really enjoyed that program. Writing Boxes was actually a program that I did um, after going to the ALA conference last year. It was a program that I learned about, um, and I was a past English teacher, so I'm very passionate about writing. Um, so this was a program I did for some kids. Um, like I had written in the report, it was an eight-week program, but they kept begging to come back, so we made it into 16 weeks. So they learned all different types of writing, from newspaper writing to writing recipes to writing directions on how to get from point A to B. Um, they would come in after the classes the next week with samples that they had um, done on their own at home. So it was really a gratifying program. And the best part was that the parents actually attended the program with the kids and did it with them. So it was kind of a family affair, which was really nice. Um, then we had our returning programs, um, which are always ones that we have done at least for the um, past couple of years that have always been popular. So we bring those back, including um, always a Harry Potter something night. Mm -hmm. We have to have at least one Harry Potter book night a year. Um, our really popular library con, which is a celebration of uh, comics and um, cosplay. Some more pictures of the kids having fun. Toddler aerobics. Uh, that was our biggest program this year besides the winter lecture series, which brings in um, between 100 and 150 people come to the winter lecture series on the different Arizona topics in February and January. Um, but for the kids, the biggest program was our toddler aerobics. Um, you can see a picture of um, one of our past librarians there, Rebecca. Uh, we had almost uh, 90 kids in one class for that. They love doing yoga. And then our numbers, our total circulation, our phys physical materials we've checked out, how many items are in our collection, our um, in-person visitors, and then some different um, segments on how many uh, things we checked out in each category from media to movies to books, and our most popular titles of the year, which were kind of interesting. <laughs> Did anybody have any questions or want to discuss anything in the annual report? I have some comments. Sure. Oh, great. It's still being used. I, I am using it. Good. <laughs> I, it was such a blessing to still be able to use the library. And I'm sure I'm not the only citizen that, um, that feels that way. I also want to comment on the writer in residence. Yes. Um, I thought that was a, a good idea. And I think it got well used. I'm not sure. But I certainly took advantage of it. And I really. I thought he was just incredible. Yes, he, he was dynamic. And his advice, and he was good. And we do have another writer in residence who is actually starting in July. Um, her name is, oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. She's from Mesa, um, but her daughters live across the street from the library, her daughter and her children. Um, when I think of it, I'll tell you her name, but um, she has written books for teenagers, um, she also does some, um, she's done one adult book that's been published, and she's also written for the Family Search newsletter um, from Mesa. So she's done a lot of school visits over the past years and teaching kids about how important writing is and how to become a writer. So uh, Valerie Ipsen, that's her name. Real Real quick, guys, um, Matt just came in and said that he was not able to hear Vera and Jim. If you guys could check your mics and make sure that they're on. Testing. So there's a button on the bottom of the base of the microphone. If it's not green, you need to press the button. There's a gray button at the actual, if you follow the stem all the way down there. for the microphone, there's actually a button. Testing. There you, go. there you go. Yeah, I see it now. Yep. Okay. It Did you notice that this picture, uh, you probably can't see it, but that's Sansi at the drive up. <laughs> <laughs> and and I do have a couple of things as well. Uh, first of all, I guess officially welcome as the new director of the, the library because this is your first official library board meeting. It so. is. Thank yeah. you. So welcome, and we are happy to have you. I know we all got your introduction and, and stuff as well. 
Um, so one, I would like to ask if you could just kind of give a, a highlight, because I don't know if anybody's watching, but if they are, then I want them to be able to see that. Um, Braden, could we do that after we get done with the agenda item, Absolutely, please? yes. Thank you. Um, but uh, then for the visitors on the visitor count, um, are those unique or returning or just all encompassing? Do we know necessarily what the difference of like new visitors to returning visitors are? That is, that is something we're not able to uh, calculate. That is the door count. Okay. So when they come through either door, it gets counted on the meter that's on there. Got it. Um, and then for the uh, drive up window, mm -hmm. is that going to continue post COVID-19 whenever that might be? It is. So that's a, now a permanent installation. At the it is, and wonder. that's why we did get that fancy transaction drawer. Awesome. And then the last <laughs> thing was there was a, a little blurb in there about the Friends of the Library. Yeah. Um, could you explain what the Friends of the Library is and how people could get involved as, as the community supports that effort? Sure. So the Friends of the Library is a 501c3 um, nonprofit. Um, it is a volunteer position. If you want to apply to be a volunteer with the Friends of the Library, you need to fill out an application on the, um, the city's website. Um, those ladies and gentlemen um, mostly work in the Friends of the Library bookstore, which is at the west entrance when you come in. So they do everything from um, sorting through the donations, um, ones that they don't feel can be sold because they have too much damage, um, they get recycled. But the ones that we, they could sell to raise money for library events, um, they do sell at very good prices. If you haven't been in to look at them, you can get, sometimes people donate like bestsellers that are still on the bestsellers list and you can get them for 75 cents. Um, so they work really hard um, to, to be there to um, sell those materials and promote our programs and to support um, the special projects and things we do at the library. Awesome. Later, Braden. That is it. I, I thought as a whole, this report was very readable. I mean, it was easy to get the facts and you didn't have to look through a bunch of numbers. I just thought it was easy to read. I like that, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even as a librarian, I like that. Because <laughs> yeah, most people that pick this up aren't gonna pour through it. Exactly. You know, and I thought this served its purpose quite well. Well, great, thanks. I appreciate that. Jane? Hi. Do you have anything? I do not. I have one more question, sure. actually. Um, and I don't know that this is the appropriate time, but I, for one, am not a big Facebook user. And I got my information mainly from the news, the newspaper, which we no longer get. I would immediately go to the what to do section and see what was going on at the library and that's how I learned a lot of the events as well as the citizen that comes out. Are you um, doing anything different uh, now that the news is no longer available? Um, the citizen has also been um, postponed for this next um, quarter because of the fact that the newspaper is, is, is no longer. Um, we are, we're still sending things to the, the Apache Junction Independent, so there's that option. I know that doesn't come out weekly. Um, we're still working on how to get the word out about other things. It's really hard in a, in a town this size that where the, main, where the paper was really um, yeah. a big marketing tool. Um, if you have any suggestions, I would be more than welcome to hear them. Um, but yeah, I mean, word of mouth is always big for everything that we do at the library. Once somebody, you know, sees, um, or comes to a program or, or gets a great um, book or title at the library, they pass it on to someone else. Um, but of course, we have a large um, winter visitor population too. So um, that is something we're definitely gonna have to work on because we know that there's a lot of um, residents that aren't on Facebook and the ones that are on there pretty much know who we are at this point because we're pretty socially active on there. Thank you. You're welcome. I just had one observation. <clears throat> 28,000 holds. That's like a lot of holds. So we must have a pretty good inventory of stuff that people want. That, that just jumped out at me. 28,000 times people call the library to put something on hold. <laughs> 
Yes, I have to say that the holds though also aren't just materials in our branch or our library, but it's for the whole, um, it's our customers placing holds on items that are within the Pinal County right. system. Right, where they can get them from another, another location. Right, with our free courier service. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Any more questions on the, or discussion on the budget? Or the, brief, uh, I'm sorry, the annual report? Could I get a motion to accept the annual report, please? I'll make a motion we accept the annual report as stated. Second. Motion has been made and seconded to accept the annual report as written, as stated. Or is there any more discussion? If not, let's take a vote, please, James. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Braden Biggs? Yes. Judy Borey? Samuel Graves? Yes. James Jackson? Yes. Frank Schoenbeck? Yes. Vera Walters. Yes. Uh, motion passes 6-0. Let's move on to the next uh, item on the agenda discussion, possible vote on having no overdue charges or collection of late fines for any library materials. Pam, I guess you're on the, budget, on the spotlight again. I am. <laughs> I am. So I also sent to you a, um, a memorandum with a find-free proposal that I had created um, with some hyperlinks to different articles and different studies and research on um, how fines are disproportionately affecting our lower socioeconomic um, citizens and communities. Um, I know there's going to be some discussion about this because Braden has already asked me some questions when he first got here. <laughs> So um, did everybody, first of all, get to read the report, or do you need a copy to refer to while you're here tonight? Yes? No, I got it. You've got it with you? Okay. Mm -hmm. Did any, I don't have that one for the screen, so it's a little bit long to put on the screen. Okay. Um, so rather than go through the whole report again, if, if we want to... Um, discuss the topic a little bit and see if you have any questions, concerns. Braden, you have something? Uh, all of my stuff was, was really answered. Um, when I was just kind of combing through it, I, I will initially say my, my viewpoints kind of changed from when I first started looking at this to, to the end result. Um, I think the, the biggest thing that, that kind of struck out, or stuck out to me rather, um, was when I was taking a look, if you guys, for those of you who were on the library board last year when we implemented the change to the, the youth side and took away those fines and fees, um, just, I, I mean, all in all, we're looking at 171,000, almost 172,000, but it's dating back to 1998. So in the grand scheme of it, it's not a lot of money when you're going back 22 years. Um, but, uh, the, the thing that really struck out to me, though, too, was the, the number, and I, I can't find it for some reason, um, the, um, with the kids that, that we haven't seen a big increase actually come back since doing that. So I, I'd like to hear kind of what, we're, what, what our plan is to reach out to people and get them back into the library because, I mean, ultimately that's where we're going to make the money is by people coming in and, and you know, utilizing the services that we have. Um, and we're looking at 9,500 people. So uh, that, that uh, to me, that's a, a pretty significant number when it's 17% of our total account. So ha do you guys have a plan for what, what we're going to do to market this to people to let them know that, hey, you can come back and use our, our services? Yeah, that's a good question. And of course, that goes back to what Vera just asked too. Um, one thing that um, is promising is that um, the bookmobile, the Fun Van bookmobile that's, been, that's in our parking lot, um, we recently just received um, a grant from the State Library using the CARES Act funds to be able to utilize that bookmobile to go out um, to some of our areas in the city to provide Wi-Fi hotspot services and to also um, demonstrate some of the different technologies that we have at the library, such as the virtual reality. To, um, we'll, we are gonna have tablets on there so if people need to access the internet and don't have their own device. Um, 
So we, we're going to strategically plan where we go with the bookmobile, even though it's not going to have books on it. It's going to be a way for us to get some of those people that normally may not come to the library for books to let them know that now they're able to either come back if they've had overdue fines that have been waived um, or if they've never had a card. Like you were saying when we got here, there's people that don't even know there's a library here in town. <laughs> so that is going to be a great way that we can let them know that we're there. Okay. Definitely. Awesome. Thank you. Anybody else have anything to say? I did. I had a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Um, on page three, I think it is, it starts, U.S. have gone fine free, including the Florence Community Library, which has not charged overdue fine for years, Scottsdale Public Library, etc. Does the Pinell County Library when you check out things from them, either through Hoopla or interlibrary loan, do they charge fines? Are you talking about um, e-materials, like e-books? So if you go, if, if you go to like um, Overdrive or Cloud Library, right. none of the e-products have fines. Because they're, well I know Overdrive is brought back, on, you don't have a choice. Right. Right, none oh. of those products, nothing that you um, check out online or virtually, remotely, has any fines associated with it. But if I did an interlibrary loan with the Pinell County Library and they found the book or whatever it is in some other place and I got it, will there be fines for those? You could be charged by that library that loaned you the material. You could yes. be. Mm -hmm. okay. And every library in Pinell County has their own uh, fine and fee structure. I do want to say that I think the automatic renewal was a, a tremendous idea because those of us whose memory is fading <laughs> often <laughs> miss that <laughs> date and all of a sudden you get an email and oh good. Yeah, so I, I appreciate that. And that dramatically reduced the amount of fines that are accrued every year. So that has been pretty much cut in half. We talked about the 171 um, being the total number, but I believe I have a statistic um, in there about, um, yeah, the, the year before we had the uh, fine renewal, um, the amount collected was 22,000, but after the auto renewal went into effect, it went down almost in half to 13,349. So that did have a dramatic effect on the amount of fines that are out there. And um, one thing we were talking about when we first got here, Braden, was um, the responsibility. Sometimes people have a hard time um, thinking, well, we, we, need to, we need to teach people responsibility to bring back their books on time or the materials on time so others can check it out. But the important thing to remember about that is the, the people are going to do it anyway. <laughs> well, the people that are consistently late with materials, they're going to continue to be late, regardless if you get rid of fees or not. Mm -hmm. um, the, only thing, the only thing that's really going to change is that those that can't afford to pay the, fee, the fines, they're no longer be able, going to be able to use the library, which is exactly what we want to prevent. Mm -hmm. We don't want to punish everybody for having a bad memory or something happen in their life where they don't remember to bring back their books and then all of a sudden they bring them back and they owe $30 and you know that's their electric bill and they can't afford to pay them and then we never see them again. Yeah. And, and that was something that I was looking at. I'm, I'm very data driven and analytical in that regard and I was taking a look at them. We were talking about this earlier is that we have 9,500 accounts that are blocked from being able to utilize the service because they have fines of $5 or more. So I just did the math and looked at that at $5 at that 9,500, that's 47,000. That is a lot of money, that's a staff position, you know. But then I started looking at that and comparing that back to kind of where Pam was saying in the overdue fees and things, you know, seeing that significant drop. I even went as far to look at the budget this year just to see what we've collected and it's $7,000 for this year. I mean, it's it, that's really where I started looking at this and going, oh, it's not a big of a, you know, I do truly think that this is going to be an incentive. Um, and I do like, and, and I would like to talk just a little bit about that uh, in the proposed change about people and their responsibility for returning. Um, in here, you do have, um, 
uh, that under the proposed change, daily overdue fines on late materials will be eliminated. However, patrons will continue to be responsible for returning library materials, which will save, or I'm sorry, which will still have due dates and that the library will still continue to collect fees which are charged uh, for damages and lost items as well as collection agency fees. So we're not getting rid of everything. People still do need to return it. And I believe after 100 days, it's considered lost. Correct. So there still is a, an, an item of uh, uh, responsibility at the end of the proposal. It's not like everybody's just off scot-free. We're just, I, I see it as trying to eliminate the uh, non-malicious, more or less, uh, offenders rather than keeping people away from the library, making a negative experience for exactly. them. Exactly. Take nope. away that, that bite and make it more welcome because the bite isn't worth it. It's it's not, and it's it, okay. it it can be stressful for staff. I mean, I I was on the front lines at our library for six years until just a couple months ago, and it's not a it's not a happy experience when you have somebody that's gets upset because they checked out materials three years ago, don't remember bringing them back late, and we're telling them they owe us fifteen dollars, which um, you know staff feel like they need to to follow our processes and that you know turns somebody off from coming back to the library and um, it it's just not a great experience for the user or the staff people so no winners no, no money doesn't make us a winner You're right. <laughs> any other discussion on this yeah, item i had a couple sure. other things oh, oh james you're still oh. hanging let me have james ahead of you. Okay. okay james you've been hanging on thank you that's okay i i, I just had a, i guess a, a thought that i wondered if you don't have fines <clears throat> what is the experience of other libraries as far as materials uh, you know books um i think eventually we can recover those pretty easily but um if, if we have a, a DVD or whatever other, other materials we have, if they don't have the penalty of, of returning it, it is, the, is the experience of other libraries that they are now nearly impossible to recover. I, what I'm wondering is, is that uh, they've now lost the, uh, the incentive, okay, to return it, okay, Per, per se, I, I mean, hopefully everybody's an honest person and they want to return it. Right. But it's kind of like, uh, you know, I mean, these are some some of these materials have a much shorter time, and so if they don't if they don't return it, you know, and now oh that's okay, you're not going to get uh, a penalty cost wise and stuff. Well, I have no real incentive to return it until next year. Yeah. It, <laughs> so what happens? Yeah. Well, um, I did address that in the in the proposal that yeah. um, there are um, reports, studies from other libraries that have done it that are reporting that actually nothing changes. Nothing changes. Nothing okay. changes. Um, or the bigger scope of things, um, they were finding that they get if they get things back a little bit later than they did, it wasn't so much that it was causing um, any sort of a, a detriment. Um, but a lot of the libraries reported that they're actually getting things back sooner. Okay. Which I was surprised at too. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, but one of the great things that a lot of the libraries experienced is when they first did this is that they got back a ton of material that had been lost for many years. Because if you're a person that forgot to bring something back, you know you're going to get, you look at your account, you have $15 of fines, you don't want to pay it. Well, you're just going to keep the item. You'll never return it, right? Yeah. So will, now people are want to come back and use the library, and they're returning their items that we haven't seen in years. <laughs> so it's like Christmas in July. <laughs> can, can we do this with city parking tickets? That would go <laughs> really great. That's not my department, Braden, but we can discuss that later. <laughs> okay, moving right along. Is that it, Jane? That's it. Thank you. Vera, you had something else? Yeah. I, in one of the statements, uh, one of the uh, press releases states that more than 65,000 items have been checked out this year by people with cards that were previously blocked due to late fees. Will you track, is there any way you can track the people who owe fines that aren't using the library 
Now, when their fines are forgiven, will you track that they are now using the library to see if this is actually an incentive? Yes, our circulation software does have um, some pretty big power behind it. it. It can narrow those things down so we can see, um, just like we did with the, the children's cards with the how many patrons we got back that hadn't used their card because they were blocked. It, it, that is definitely something that the software can do. So yeah, it's, it's really interesting. You I can look backwards and say, yeah, that was a good decision. Exactly. Yeah. The other thing was, will, will overdue <coughs> items still be tracked even though there's no fine? Will yes. you still know how many people were late in yes. bringing their items back? We'll still continue sending out the emails, the text messages, the phone calls. We'll still... When people come up to the service desk to check out, if they have an overdue item, we have the, um, we can say you can't check out again until we get these ones back. So we do have that behind us as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. there's no yep. So everything anymore. will still have a due date. You'll still get a receipt with the date on it. Okay. It's we'll just still find you, Vera. Don't worry. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm definitely in favor of this proposal. I just have... Yeah, it's it's an interesting topic. I had a I had a lot of lot of fun looking at all the different reports yeah. and studies yeah. because it seems like almost every week now in the library journals and and whatnot that you see another library district eliminating fines and especially when you know a big library district like Mar Maricopa County and Pima County just eliminated theirs yeah. to see them do that. I mean yeah. that's. That's a big accomplishment. I think I only have one more question. Okay. On your proposed new procedures, uh, the <laughs> listing one through six, it says if overdue library materials are not returned, the patron will be held responsible for the replacement cost of the item. Is it actually the, uh, the actual replacement cost? It is. It is the cost that we paid to get the item brand new, okay. and that is what we charge the customer. We don't charge them a fee. A lot of libraries will charge like a processing fee on top of that. We don't do that. Um, but we don't accept um, if somebody goes to the store and buys the book and brings it in. Unfortunately, we don't have the capacity at this time to accept that as a replacement. We need to buy it through our vendors. Oh, really? Yeah. Hmm. Yep. Well, you have a special library edition, don't you, you most kinds? Sometimes. Yeah. Some, some, some um, yeah. Volumes do. They're a little stronger. and Yeah, the, the library right. bindings right. and whatnot. Exactly. But we also get a lot of our materials already pre-processed, okay. so it's, it's part of our, our, our package that we have with our vendors. So. Well, now this is probably a, a not too knowledgeable question, but so I don't understand item number five. Okay. In, in light of the, the proposed procedure. Okay, so let's see, we are looking. Okay, so patrons owing more than $5 will not be able to borrow library materials, but regular borrowing privileges will resume once fees over five are paid for or lost items are returned. So although, although we're pr proposing to eliminate the overdue fines, there could still be um, charges on the account for items that are that are never returned or Got for it. items that are returned damaged. Got it. And our um, policy or procedure right now is um, if you have charges over five dollars, your your account is blocked. Okay. So that would still be um, the same as it's been. Got it. Thank you. Not a dumb question. You're welcome. Sammy, do we have any questions? He's been very quiet. Yeah. He understands everything so well, he has no need to ask. <laughs> if there are no further questions, I'd ask for a, a motion. I move that we accept the proposal to um, forgive the fines and not collect future fines for patrons. Second. Second, and uh, motion is made and seconded. Any more discussion? A vote, please. Braden Biggs. Yes. Judy Borey, not here. Samuel Graves? Yes. James Jackson? Yes. Vera, Vera Walters? Yes. Frank Schoenbeck? Yes.
Motion passes. All right, moving on to the next agenda item, discussion and possible vote on proposed updates to library circulation procedures. Okay, so this is just um, showing you what our new fine fee schedule would look like. So it's basically just showing you that in our library procedures, charges would be eliminated for the overdue late fees on all types of items, including books, kits, audio, interlibrary loans, multimedia games, equipment, devices, and those are physical items, not electronic items. Um, and then of course, you already did last, uh, last year the no late fees on children's materials. So this is just showing you that those things would be eliminated from the document, um, the other fees um, would st sorry about that. The other fees would still be in effect, which includes um, library card fees for out of county registrants, library card replacement if they lose their card, and so forth. Um, we sometimes um, charge some charges for things that c that don't come back with the material. So if it was um, an audio video and it came back without the case, we might charge them $2 for the case and that's kind of as a, as we see fit type of charge. And then we go into our copying and printing, which is a whole different section. So are there any questions about how that would look? Any discussion on this? Well, that's pretty straightforward after what we've just been through. Yeah, right. probably should have done that part first, but it was kind of dependent on the on the other agenda item. <laughs> All right, I'd entertain a motion here to accept the proposed updates to the library circulation procedure. I move to accept the proposed updates to the library circulation procedure. Can I get a second? Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Without any more discussion, we'll take a vote. James, please. Sure. Braden Biggs. Yes. Uh, Samuel Graves. Yes. James Jackson. Yes. Vera Walters. Yes. And Frank Schoenbeck. Yes. <clears throat> Motion has been passed. So we're done with the, uh, the business part of this. Let's have a little social time and understand a little bit more about our new library director. <laughs> oh, you remembered. Oh, I did. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I gave you a, a very brief introduction because I gave you a lot of rating for this, for this meeting. So my introduction was brief. Um, but I have been a, a librarian in public schools, um, mostly middle schools, and um, public libraries for going on 23 years now. I've been with Apache Junction Public Library as the Youth Services Supervisor since uh, July 9th, 2016, 15, 14, yes. <laughs> I had to think about that. Yeah, it's going to be six years. You're not a math person. I, well, yeah, sometimes. <laughs> um, uh, I don't have any children, but I, um, I'm a big uh, dog and cat lover, so I have three dogs currently and one cat. I'm married. Um, I don't know what else to tell you. What would, what would you like to know about me? <laughs> Uh, well, just to give you a little background on who we are as an organization, uh, this is big time for us. Usually we meet in the little conference room over in the library, and um, Spencer just took care of pretty much everything, and we didn't have much to do. <laughs> so we're, uh, uh, I guess, we're the eyes and ears of the community, but the library's been so well run that we don't have much to do as far as keeping track of things. And... Uh, so you're, you got big shoes to fill there, but so far it appears like you got them well filled and we're right on our way to continuing what's been one great library. In oh, time. thank you, appreciate that. This is a great library. Have you been in lately since, um, since uh, COVID-19? No. No, I okay. Haven't. Vera probably knows every square inch of that library. Well, now. I did before <coughs> COVID, before but COVID. I have not been in mm. since. Well, we did a lot of cleaning and a lot of straightening and a lot of um, updating on some of our signage. Um, it looks really nice right now if you do if you do get to come in, um, but 
it'll look like that for a long time, so no hurry. But yeah, we, we worked really hard when we weren't open, so it wasn't like we were sitting back reading books or anything, even you, though we really wanted to. You continue the tradition of uh, departments in Apache Junction and between Parks and Rec and the library, it's just been continually being impressed with how well you adjust to changing circumstances. Thank whether you. Whether, you know, the pandemic was like, wow, but since we had the senior services go away from Parks and Rec from the senior center, that was a crisis we had to handle. Um, and it just seems like the city, and the, well, it, uh, Parks and Rec has been challenged with the changing school schedule, as has the library. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. So when we go from four to five days and back again, the response in both departments has just been outstanding. And I think it's part of what makes this community very attractive to, mm -hmm. to people and why we all like to live here. And definitely kudos to all library staff. I mean, you guys went through the, the pandemic for one, the opening of the, the drive-through, a new director, the reopening of the library. I mean, a lot of things were, were changing and, and nothing that I saw got dropped and still yeah. continued to hear great things. And just like the drive-through and the compliments, I, I've heard so many wonderful things about having that. So it's a, it's a great addition and I look forward to being able to see that prosper. I think we're the only ones that have a drive-through library right that i'm aware of yes i don't know of any other nearby library that has one i know prescott valley has one um which is another beautiful library if you're up at prescott valley but yeah so we're like one of a kind i'm just glad uh we were able to make it happen so quickly and um seamlessly and it's yeah we can't wait to start offering additional services out of the window as well I want to comment that I'm very proud to be on this board because I hear comments from people all over town how wonderful our library is. We have things that big cities don't have. And, and I think meeting the needs of our community has always been number one for our library and you meet it very, very well. Well, thank you. I'll make sure Mr. Payton knows that. Uh, you said that as well. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I have a quick question for you. Maybe not quick, but um, almost like a job interview. So what do you see in five years, in 10 years? Where do you, where do you see the library going? What, what's your grand vision? <laughs> my, and how can we help? Right. Well, <laughs> yeah. well my, my passion is to, is to be more of a community center with more um, community events going on, not saying that our library programs um, aren't great, but I would love to have more of other community organizations, other community events take place in the library and for us to do more things with other community organizations. Um, I think that electronic services are gonna continue to increase um, which usually means less people are coming into the library. Um, of course, you always have your people that love to have that solid book in their hand, um, but we need to have ways that people are still gonna come through the doors and have an experience, whether it's getting a, a, a book or a movie, as well as attending a, a meeting or some sort of an event. Um, so that's what I hope to do, is to make us more of a community hub, if you would. I think the introduction of your winter lecture series was a great idea. Yes, yes, it was. It was, that is, like I said, our, our biggest um, program of the year, and it's, it's two straight months of a lot, of, a lot of times new people coming into the library, a lot of winter visitors that are sometimes just getting there for the first year, and I think it gives them a great um, perspective of the services we offer and all of the materials that we have to, to serve them. So, yeah, yeah, we love it, and it's such, a, such interesting topics. Can't go wrong with a, the winter lecture series. Anybody else have anything for this evening? I don't think we schedule our next meeting at this time, so at this point, at 7.15, we will adjourn. Thank you. <laughs>